Hey everybody, Aaron Cowan, Sage Dynamics, and this week we're going to talk about follow through and scanning during training and practice. Hands, get your hands up, get your hands up! Now for a definition of terms, what we're talking about. Follow through is the physical act of following your threat through to the ground or to wherever their, their surrender resting place is. Uh, if I have a reason to use lethal force, the weapon comes out, I fire how many rounds it takes my threat to stop doing whatever they were doing that caused me to shoot them in the first place. And then I maintain a loose sight picture or, you know, an aim sight picture to make sure they're no longer a threat. Maybe I'm issuing verbal commands like drop the gun, drop the knife, move over here, get on your back, get on your stomach, get on your knees, whatever the situation may be, that is follow through. We want to do it as fast as we can, but there's no rush because that is our known imminent threat. Now, once follow through is completed, scanning makes a lot of sense because bad guys travel in packs. If you think about all the shooting videos you've seen, and, and we're seeing more and more of them recently because of cell phones and, and CCTV and things like that, is you'll see three guys stealing a car or four guys robbing a store. Does that really make any sense from a profit point of view? Because this is a profit crime. They're stealing the car for probably profit, and they're robbing a store probably for profit. But why are there four of them? Why does it take four guys to rob a store? How much money are they possibly going to get? Uh, with a car theft, you think about, well, only one person can drive. Uh, so unless they're going to sell the vehicle, and the more people you have involved in the theft of the vehicle, the more people you have to cut in on the deal. So, and of course this is anecdotal, but it kind of stands to common sense that if there's four bad guys stealing a car, there's more motivation there for strength in numbers, so to speak, than there is for strictly criminal profit. Same with a store. If they're getting two, three hundred bucks out of the cash register, they got to split that four ways. That's not a huge profit for a forcible felony. So. I follow through on my threat, and because I know, just based on the shootings I've seen on video, real life situations, talking about talking to other people, collective knowledge, and things like that, there could be another bad guy. It behooves me to look for that other bad guy. So coming off the gun, and I'm physically going to take a full 360 degree view of the world around me. It's not a quick left right. It's not 180. It's 360. Uh, I encourage people on the range to physically turn around, point your muzzle in a safe direction and physically turn your body and look. Uh, it's something that there are quite a few instructors that teach, but it's not something that is necessarily reinforced. So guys doing this halfway through the day, no one's fixing them. No one's giving them a reason to actually want to scan because every time they scan left or right, they're either seeing their, their fellow classmates on the line or they're seeing nothing at all that's threatening them. Now fixing follow through is as simple as making your practice or your training more realistic. Got a balloon. These are pretty cheap. Uh, you can buy them in bulk on Amazon. Um, I'm sure everyone who's had a childhood is at, least for, is at least roughly familiar with how these things work. You tie it in a knot, kind of like that. It's the air in, really cool. I wouldn't suggest using helium for this. Uh, and then you use your target. Now I use three-dimensional targets. You don't have to, but I highly encourage it because people are three-dimensional. Uh, I've got a hole in the back. This is high thoracic. You can do the head, you can do whatever you want. I simply insert the balloon into the chest cavity. I pull the knot through the rear of the target. And now I can staple this to whatever my shooting media is, be it a stick or a wall or, or what have you. And obviously um, I can angle it however I want because it's three dimensional target. This gives me a hit zone. If I want to make it more realistic, I have someone else prep my targets for me. Everyone who's a shooter has two or three friends that are shooters as well. You can make training very realistic for a very, very small cost. Balloons and then these targets, these targets run about two bucks per, but they'll last you all day long. Uh, you want to make it more realistic because let's be honest, most people are going to go down with one solid center mass hit, but it'd be nice if they did. Um, more balloons, smaller balloons. Blow up a bunch of small balloons the sizes of tangerines and fill the chest full of them. It's going to take four or five hits to get all those balloons, which will then cause the target to drop. Once the target drops, that induces follow through. The target's going to go down like a person will, hopefully, after we shoot them X amount of times. So however many rounds it takes to disrupt their, their physiology enough to cause them to either surrender or go unconscious or whatever. Physically, I'm going to follow my threat to the ground because now I'm out of the training mentality of shooting a target X amount of times or a random amount of times, but it never actually goes down. Now my targets are going down. 
it does cut into your practice time. If you've only got a few hours on the range, this is going to se severely limit you um, from being able to shoot as many rounds. But I think the training value is definitely there, and it's something you can set it up just two or three times during your practice period and get a lot of really good results for it. X amount of rounds, head hits, high thoracic hits, wherever the, the hit zone is going to be, and then I physically have to follow my target to the ground. If your range allows it, your practice partner can then call, he's down, he's down, he's down, or possibly like he's getting up, he's getting up, he's getting up, and forces you to engage a threat who's on the ground because as we know, down does not necessarily mean done. Um, three things can happen when you shoot somebody. An immediate reaction, a delayed reaction, and no reaction. Um, outside of hits to the central nervous system, the best you're going to get is a delayed reaction. Delayed reaction can be going to the ground and then starting to get back up. It has happened before. Of course, all shooting information from actual shootings is anecdotal because uh, no two shootings are going to be alike, but there are some constants. Um, so we want to be prepared for the fact that the threat can get up or at least prepared for physically maintaining a sight picture on that bad guy when he's on the ground, making sure he's down, then breaking off that gun, getting rid of potential tunnel vision, and then starting to look and see if he's got any friends. Drop a gun, drop a gun! He's getting up, he's getting up, he's getting up! That's your follow through drill. Uh, that's a very basic way to set it up. And obviously you can introduce scanning drills into that where I have potential threats or maybe more hit reactive threats left or right, whatever. Um, what I do when I'm practicing by myself since I don't have anyone out here to assist me is I'll initiate the drill off a shot timer and then using my cell phone, I record myself saying threat, he's down, threat, he's down. I spread it out, spread it out, spread it out. And when I run the drill, I just hit play on that. Um, if I mix it up enough or if I pause it and then go on for the next drill, I don't necessarily know what's coming. So in this particular situation, it called out threat. So I put some more rounds on my bad guy because he was potentially getting up. Now obviously, training artificiality. Once the cardboard goes down, the cardboard stays down. But I think some of you, probably all of you, should be able to see this is already more realistic than hanging an NRA B27 with score rings and just shooting tight groups. Tight groups are important, but with the self-defense focus, to me, this is priceless, and it doesn't involve an, a, a dramatic uh, requirement of uh, an investment. You don't have to spend a whole lot of money to train this way or practice this way. You do have to have access to a range that allows it, um, which is obviously unfortunate for some people who live in urban areas and all they have is indoor ranges, but there is somewhere near you, if you look hard enough, that you could go to once or twice a month, 50 to 100 rounds, and run drills like this. So. If I'm coming back in, putting my muzzle, you know, in a safe direction, wherever I'm going to point it, down, up, left, right, whatever, and I scan, and every time I scan, I don't see anything, you're running the risk of creating a confirmation bias, uh, which is very true. There's an art a couple articles out there about it, about saying, well, you should be very careful teaching scanning because it forces a confirmation bias. But here's the thing. Uh, the human mind doesn't quite work that way. Uh, if I scan and I don't see anything, and I scan and I don't see anything, and I scan and I don't see anything, and I scan and I don't see anything, that does create a confirmation bias in a training environment. But if I scan and see another threat, my brain is going to process that as a threat. It is pre-conscious thought. Threats are threats. If you think about walking through a field, we often mistake sticks for snakes. Because the alternate is to mistake a snake for a stick, which is highly dangerous. That's pretty much been bred out of our DNA as we evolved. We've gotten to the point where we assume the worst with our body threat alarm and then we process the data as we can and realize okay yeah it's just a stick people work the same way if i'm if i'm encouraging people to scan and they're actually doing it not just the 180 but physically turning around and seeing the world around them they're much more likely to do that in a shooting situation they're also much more likely to pick up that second possible threat and of course, it's not necessarily going to be a threat. You think about, you can scan and see a potential witness. You want to identify that witness. You want that witness to stay there and hopefully assist you in explaining what exactly went place in the shooting situation. At the very least, you want their contact information. If you're not practicing scanning, if you're not practicing that skill set, then you're something you're probably not going to do in a shooting situation. Get your hands up, get your hands up, get your hands up. Now, one of the biggest complaints I guess I could say I have with my peers is they say, well, you know, they're on the range, there's never going to be a threat. Um, that's a training issue. That's not a student issue. 
It is the instructor's responsibility to make training as realistically as possible if they call themselves a self-defense instructor. There are ways to drill people to scan and see threats or no threats. Everybody likes, likes judgment shooting, right? So we want to we want to utilize verbal commands. We want to have threats that aren't threats. We want to have threats that are threats. We want to have unknowns. We want to make things as realistic as possible because we don't want to train people to shoot every single time. That's why we got away from tap rack bang to tap rack reassess. You may not need to shoot once you fix the malfunction. Things of that nature. So if I have a guy scanning and I'm able to put a target in his peripheral vision on a range and he scans and it could be a threat, it could be a non-threat. Of course that means I probably have to run my range one student at a time. If I'm running a class full of 12, that one drill has to be ran 12 times for 12 different students. I don't see a problem with that. Uh, people come to me for realistic self-defense training. So as an instructor, it's my job to make their training as realistic as possible. So if I'm teaching every single drill, every single scenario, and every single te technique with all of my students on the line at the same time, how realistic is that? We as instructors have to be able to deliver the most realistic training possible. So there's no reason whatsoever that an instructor can't rework his curriculum to introduce scanning drills, to reinduce shoot don't shoots that involve more than one direction. Um, really getting out of that square range mentality is what I'm talking about. And I'm not just talking to, to students and fans, but I'm talking to my peers as well. If you're not teaching scanning because it doesn't fit into your curriculum, find a way to where it does fit into your curriculum and make things a little bit more realistic. Hey, it's hands! Now this is a pretty good example of a very simple drill is what I'm talking about. I've got a threat to the front and someone, another student, this instructor, someone else can set up target stands on either side of the student. And we've got these little arms here. Um, these are the UTC tack drop targets. So the targets I use teach the majority of my classes. The advantage is they can have knives, they can have guns, they can have nothing. You just break it off and now I've got empty hands. I've got just basically arms up. Not super realistic, but definitely more realistic than 2D you're probably used to training on. In this situation, either Another student stages it or the instructor stages it. I know something's there. I know a person's there. Um, that's a training artificiality. But in this situation, I engage my threat, and then as I'm doing my scan, I see another person. It causes me to engage that person. Issue verbal commands, make sure they're not a threat. It could be a shoot, it can be a no-shoot. A very, very simple drill. Now, obviously, if I'm running a class, safety concern is I'm firing in two directions, or potentially firing in two directions. Well, that's pretty easy because I just stage all of my students who aren't running the drill in a safe area. It's that simple. I can run 12 people through this very drill or variations of this drill. It's gonna take 10, 15, 20 seconds per student or longer depending on how many shoots, no shoots, possible shoots I set up on the scenario. Uh, for those of you that come to my defensive handgun fundamentals, defensive rifle fundamentals, and so on classes, you know that at the end of the day, you're going to turn around and you're going to face eight or nine threats, possible threats, targets, different depths, different angles, different situations where you may have up to, you know, one threat, two threat, three threat, four threat, and a whole bunch of innocents that you have to work angles around so you don't shoot, uh, shoot the innocent people. But this is a simple L drill, very simple to set up. If you want to make it more realistic, this target can be run on a 10-foot PVC pole. It may be there, it may not. The student knows it's possible. Already we have eliminated confirmation bias and scanning and never seeing anything in training. It's that simple. So is follow through an important skill? Absolutely. Make sure the threat's down. Is scanning an important skill? I can't really see a reason for not doing it. Uh, if I've given due, due attention to my initial threat, and okay, at least for the now, for the next second, he's down. Now I need to see if he's got, if there's other threats. I'm simply just getting a look at the world around me. Um, not only am I seeing other potential threats, but I'm seeing potential witnesses, I'm seeing possible exits, uh, I'm moving myself away from potential danger situations, I'm identifying cover, I'm identifying concealment, all of these things. Maybe I'm searching for my family members or my friends that were with me right before the shooting happened. Scanning is huge. You can create confirmation biases in training settings though. But as an instructor, it's my job to eliminate the artificialities as much as possible. So I've shown you some examples of ways that I do that in my classes. Uh, and I think that if, if an instructor is going to say, well, I'm a self-defense instructor, and he's not going to teach scanning, well, already you're getting people used to just shooting in one direction, and that's wrong. Um, even if he has students shooting two directions, eh, that's better. Uh, but are we introducing shoot, no shoot? Are we introducing the ability to scan and physically have a target or a potential target? Uh, in our peripheral vision or behind us, depending on how we set the drill up, depending on what our range allows. Um, I can't really see, like I said, a beneficial gain to not scanning. 
I want as much data as I can possibly get in any situation. If I've just used my weapon in the real world in a self-defense shooting, I want as much information as I can get as fast as I can safely get it. So for me, scanning is something I'm going to continue to teach, but I'm not going to mindlessly instruct my students to just get used to turning their head, looking around, and seeing nothing. That would be a disservice. I would be doing them a disservice if that was the way I was going to instruct people. Um, and obviously there's an evolution of things, but we need to get people used to the idea that if they do teach scanning, or as a student, if you're going to use scanning in your practice, every now and then, as much as possible, you need to see something. It may not be a target you need to shoot, but you need to physically get used to the idea of seeing something. Um, on the physiology side of things, um, we already talked about, you know, the stick is a snake. It's safer than thinking the snake is a stick. Uh, that goes back to, uh, and these are two $15 words, but it's called cognitive interpolation. We see something out of our peripheral vision and our mind fills in the blanks before we look at it and observe and orient on it. So if I see a coat rack in the corner of a dimly lit room, I safely assume that could be a man because it's safer than assuming it's a coat rack. Situation dependent. Um, that's the reason you, you always hear about that one cop that one guy knows who shot a mirror. Well, he saw a guy out of this corner of his eyes with a gun. Uh, it just happened to be him. Um, better he shoot a mirror than someone else and obviously he should have gathered more data before he decided to shoot, but that's why situations like that happen. So if I'm seeing something out of the corner of my eye and I'm not used to scanning, can I have the similar situation where I fire before I have enough data to justify a use of force? Scanning is huge. Instead of letting people rely on their natural ability to cognitively interpolate on the data they're collecting, let's teach them to look, to actually see, to gather all that full frontal data and then decide if they need to use force, issue verbal commands, ask for help, also call 911, hey, get over here, cover's over there, um, blah, 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 blah. As you can see, there's more to it than just putting holes in paper. Uh, putting holes in paper is important. We want to be really good shooters, but when we start thinking more realistically, more along the lines of self-defense oriented shooting, there are very, very simple ways that we can get away from those range mentalities. So when somebody tells me, well, I don't teach scanning, or I don't like scanning, or I don't use scanning because it's not realistic. It's very realistic, uh, but you have to make sure you're practicing it realistically. I'm Aaron Cowan with Sage Dynamics. Train accordingly.